on that note, let's move into the news here. And this, and actually, I believe all these, with the exception of one story, uh, Patrick recommended. Um, and this one you actually, you know, brought to us. And that's at least one Star Wars Rebels character survives until Return of the Jedi. Yes. Right? Yes. yes. Uh, so I'm going to assume that it's safe to it. I'm going to assume that it's a safe bet that you've seen and you are big into Star Wars Rebels. I love Star Wars Rebels. It's yeah. I, I, I've watched uh, the Clone Wars uh, and of course all the movies, but yeah, I've seen every episode of Star Wars Rebels the night it aired. Uh, sometimes before it airs because they have it online through the Disney XD app, and so I'm big into that show. And I need to cosplay from it sometime. I want to build a chopper. I want I want everything. <laughs> nice, but yeah. So I've seen this, and it's uh, we'll have a link to it because it's talking about the video which this is one of the things that i've been liking that they've been doing is the uh star wars forces of destiny um little shorts that they do that they'll play between sometimes between disney channel or disney xd shows that are in canon and it's focusing in on on the women of star wars because i mean let's face it in a lot of things women are forgotten star wars is one of the first ones to have you know a lot of kick-ass women and you know yes. in, the, for, in the forefront yeah, well, not so much in the original trilogy where there was uh, Leia and uh, a slave girl and Mon Mothma. I think that and, was and the three women. Your blue milk server and yeah, uh, yeah, uh, Aunt Beru. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, it's good to see Forces of Destiny giving the role model for the girls. Yeah. Uh, but it, it also, I, I like how the story fills in some little gaps here and there with Ray, uh, with Leia, and other characters. And it's a, a nice little side story. So let, let me ask you this, there, Patrick. What are your thoughts on the whole, you know, like basically Star Wars in general with the whole, this is canon, this isn't canon, we're pulling this in from non-canon to canon, all that stuff. What are your thoughts on that? Uh, I, I think canon if it's given too much weight because, yeah. you know, if it's a good story, if, if you enjoy reading it, it's great. It doesn't matter if it was ex, uh, the expanded universe and now it's not canon anymore or, uh, you know, maybe it's something that is canon or uh, it doesn't matter. As long as you enjoy it, that's good. But I do like seeing stuff like this that is in canon because that gives us the promise that there may be more coming. Uh, yeah. And so knowing that Hera and Chopper are alive by the time of uh, Return of the Jedi, they're on Endor talking to Han Solo. It tells us, oh, there's more to that story. Her uh, her timeline's not ended. So yeah. And sometimes and I wonder cool. if if the point of this is to kind of give canon back to the audience that is still kind of lost as to what is and what isn't because it was a hard thing to do that to the fans. And I know that that was ultimately a decision that probably had to be made to be able to do the, the sequels now, but you're talking about people who've been dedicated to this for 30 years. And some people have read everything and watched everything multiple times. And to say, okay, now everything that you knew, a lot of it probably isn't the same anymore. And okay, great. But they, they did this with Spider-Man a few years ago where they wiped out the Spider-Man marriage and they they changed a lot of his history in doing that. And it was a number of years of them trying to kind of let people know what exists now and what doesn't exist now, what changed, what didn't change. And even then there was so many continuity flubs because depending on the creator you had in the book or the editor you had doing it, it would it would be counterbalanced by somebody else's story saying, oh, well, no, this person knows who Spider-Man is. Oh, this person doesn't know who Spider-Man is this week. But you're right. When it comes to continuity, you kind of just have to let it go sometimes. It, it's rough because in your mind, you see it all one way. And then when you, you see the people who are in charge of it not following that, you're like, well, why? Why can't you? Isn't that your job, man? <laughs> and in the case of Star Wars, uh, so the there was so much built up through the books and comics and everything over the years that it really became complicated. You look at Wikipedia, uh, Wikipedia and you look up something like the trash compactor monster. And that thing had a origin planet, had a name, had a backstory. Yep. And it's, it's just this little thing. And so it, 
I, I could see how that made it hard to tell stories going forward because there's very few holes that hadn't been filled. So you're going to say, okay, no, this is just legends now. You can still enjoy those stories, but here's what's actually in the timeline. And, you know, maybe at some point, 20, 30 years down the line, they'll have to do it again and say, okay, this is Legends 2. We're going to tell more stories. And I, I've seen this with Transformers. I was a big fan of Generation 1. And then yeah, th then there was the comic in the, the cartoon, and they were different. And then you had the Japanese. And so th the entire history of Transformers has been different timelines, different canons. And so... Star Wars has been lucky that it's really just had that one and now they've separated. So, well, even back in the day, because when the movies were still coming out, we were already getting side stuff. We were getting Splinter of the Mind's Eye. Uh, we were getting the, the Marvel comic series of Star Wars that introduced things like Jax, who is the giant green bunny or human sized green bunny, <laughs> and, right. and all these things that it's like none of that really exactly ties in well to what they did with the series going forward. Like at first we all thought sure thing, Luke and Leia are going to get, get, get together. Right. And I think a lot of things are written towards that, that, uh, oops. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> wow, I have a lot of confusion about this now. <laughs> yeah. And beats beats saying, wasn't it dark horse? And no, uh, Marvel had the, uh, rights for star Wars or, or publishing star Wars. And then it went to dark horse, uh, later on. But yeah, so I mean, I, I look at this article, um, which w we post in our show notes and all that stuff, which has the video uh, from Disney's website, and they talk about which is something I'm more of a I'm more of a fan of, you know, like canon. Okay, it's cool, and I do enjoy canon. You know, like what is canon, what isn't canon, but it's more Easter eggs, and they give the um, they give a little Easter egg to uh, you know with Yoda throwing Luke's ration sticks in in Empire. And it took me a little bit. I'm like, wait, what are they talking about? And they have a gift playing. I'm like, oh, yeah, that's clever. You know, these little things that, you know, if I were watching it, I might have picked up on it. But if not, you know, it's the, you know, the you watch after, you know, like the, you know, the 99th viewing, you pick up on something else. It's a way to keep people watching, you know, the rewatchability of things. Yeah, I watched it, uh, that clip for the first time yesterday, and I totally missed the the reference to Yoda, but... The, the stuff like that's a really nice touch to be able yeah. to see later on. It's animated Ewoks, and man, I had a love of the Ewoks cartoon series as a kid, so it's nice to see that come back. <laughs> so the next story is that DC has cast their Shazam. Sorry, I was waiting for the lightning. And it's Zachary Levi, who we might know from playing, uh, oh God, what's this Thor, Thor character? Uh, Fandral? No. Uh, but from Chuck, you know, he was the title, the lead character in Chuck. Um, yeah, yeah, he was Fandral. Yeah, Fandral. That's right. Yeah, I, I knew it was fan something, but I couldn't get the last part. Now, this is actually interesting for me, um, and because we were talking about this before, because we knew who was Black Adam. You know, The Rock is going to be playing Black Adam, and so I was like, all right. And the, he he had there was reports when he was you know cast for this that he they basically go, which one do you want? Do you want basically in wrestling terms? Do you want to be the face or the or the heel? He's like, I'm being the heel, man. So he picked Black Adam, and so everyone's like, okay, well, who's gonna play Shazam? Are we gonna get Vin Diesel? And they're naming off all these muscle men, and then for Zachary Levi, I'm like, he's gonna put out a lot of muscle, like because he's not where he, he might. I, I think he's tall, but he's not, you know, you know, ripped, especially if he's going to be going up against the people's uh the people's champion you know at well least not, if not in the first movie you know they will be crossing paths i i grew up with uh the captain marvel shazam character uh reading the comics from from the 60s 70s 80s and he wasn't like, superheroes didn't used to be all that jacked if you go back and watch uh christopher reeve in the superman movies yeah. that was more of a superhero build for a long time that's what we looked at and it wasn't all like here's here's your twenty two pack abs uh, in every shot <laughs> like it is today, which is not a bad thing at all. And I, I I'm certain that Zachary Levi can can pull that off with a with the trainer and everything else. And it's not like he's in bad shape now. But the the essential of of the Shazam movie has been what is this movie going to be like 
when you, we've seen what is many people believe is a very dark DC film universe and if these characters are supposed to exist in the same universe which since they've said a bunch of times that Black Adam is supposed to not only get his own movie but may even go up against Superman at some point then is that darkness going to bleed over into what was probably the most kid friendly comic that comic character lead that DC had because it was brought in by another company. Um, it was the Fawcett comics and then DC acquired them by suing them into existence. And what I see from this is Zachary Levi, while maybe not the first person I would have thought of to play Shazam is a great choice in the kind of movie that I would like a Shazam movie to be because he is a big smiling guy. He's a lot of fun. He is deep in the nerd culture. He is everything that I would I would expect someone in that suit to exude. But he then also has to play kind of the straight guy in the character, which is a little weird because Shazam was kind of like he was very he was a young kid in an adult's body, but in that adult's body, he got the wisdom of Solomon. He got the gravitas of Zeus and all these other godlike characters. So it, I'm not sure exactly what this is going to be. But I kind of trust it more because of this choice than I would have even someone who I would enjoy, like a John Cena that was uh, bandied about for a while. Yeah, I mean, it's I definitely look at it like the body style is the only thing that because I, you know, I'm taking this from a a lot newer of, you know, understanding of the comic book characters and just with how they look because and all that. But trust me, I, I dig the fact that they did class, cast Zachary Levi the it, and it's also why i never do when people ask like well who would you cast i'm like uh no i do i cannot play casting director because i would probably do a lot of the picks that everyone else would do and wow i didn't even think about zachary levi for shazam yeah john um, ham was somebody that was talked about from the fan side of things and was yeah to me a pretty stellar example as to oh that could be a lot of fun and again because john ham can do humor and do lightness of character as much as he can do very serious things like in Mad Men. Yeah. And it's the other interesting part for this for me is like, I, I don't, I, I had heard that there was this unspoken rule that there's wasn't really going to be much actor crossover between the Marvel cinematic universe and the DC film universe. I'm assuming that's what the F is in a few um <laughs> so this is actually going to be the first you know this the first you know bigger star to be in both cinematic universes here what do you guys think about that part because i mean you know here you know you, you look at other you know rivalries in the nerd culture and we have crossovers with that like i know uh george decay is one of the the first if not the only person to be in both star wars and star trek uh, he he was in I think it was Rebels, oh. uh, or or not uh, Rebels, uh, Clone Wars. Simon so Pegg is Scotty, and he's a uh, Unkar Plutt. So yeah, yeah. Well, no, see this. That's why I said one one of the first. You yeah, know, and they're not like the only people. Um, it, I really and, and don't Gregor, see this. I I don't see them having Zachary Levy also play him in the marvel universe and i, no, I don't no, see no, any no, crossover no. happening <laughs> but no i mean but like we said he's he's fandral in the thor movies yeah and so and then he's also going to be like we don't really see that with you know like the only other person who's who has done like yeah. chris evans yes he has done those like he was in here and then he was over here but it's like and ryan not, reynolds was green lantern and deadpool but it wait, as wait, far as did he play green lantern yeah it's referenced yeah, we, in the beginning of Deadpool. <laughs> <laughs> and a lot of these are pre the universes where it's like they were more just licensed out to other studios to make. But now that it's, you know, we're, we've got essentially, you know, two big powerhouse studios. They're doing their own films and stuff like that. I had well, heard these it's, reports it's that there like, was... It's not like Fandral is a major character so far. And, and honestly, Zachary Levi didn't even play him in the first film. How many people noticed when he switched over in the second Thor movie to somebody else. And and how much do we know that he's going to be in Ragnarok? Uh, I would love to see a Warriors 3 uh, Sif spinoff uh, or something, or even a short, because they're talking about doing the Marvel shorts again for the, the Blu-ray DVD releases. 
that they stop for a while. But it, it's it's kind of it's the same as anything else. Is he should get his due, and Zachary Levi is someone that I think could easily play a superhero character, and it's finding the right fit for him. If it wasn't this, he could have been a good Green Lantern. It it's it's really hard to say what spot he would have filled, but if if you're in a part at Marvel that is not a giant role and you're not signed on for multiple sequels and everything else like that then yeah you should go find the place that's going to sign you up for something a little bit more major and honestly i'm looking at the list here from the article that they had other people you know they had john cena who had met with the director Derek thieler from abc family's baby daddy uh zane holtz from dusk till dawn the series uh billy magnuson magnuson from bridge of spies and then jake mcdornan from the tv series limitless I look at those and I'm sitting there like, okay, I don't, a lot of them, I don't see the potential for big, with the exception of John Cena to have this be their breakout, you know, silver screen role in there. So I, again, I still think that this is the, I, I, I love the casting choice. I think this is great, but I just don't, I don't know. Cause I still feel like this is going to be like, the Shazam Black Adam thing is going to be a little bit ways out because I think they're doing a Black Adam movie, you know, separate and then like they will meet or something. I'm hearing but, more about the Captain or the sorry, the Shazam movie being closer to filming than I hear about the Black Adam movie being closer to filming. The Black Adam movie to me is in the same boat as Gambit, uh, which is we we've talked about it for a good number of years, but when it actually is going to land is is anybody's guess. This, yeah. the Sandberg has been saying for a while, like he's put up the script and photos. He's, he's teased a lot and he's, he's mocked Twitter to a certain degree saying, you know, there's absolutely going to be people who are going to love this and people who are going to long for my death after this comes out. Uh, so it'll be fun to see who lands where. But I, I like that about him is because he's got a good sense of humor going in just about how people are going to react. And how do you handle that? That is such a scary place to be in Hollywood right now is being in charge of one of these fan based properties. And, and there's the potential for a huge payoff. If you're, if you're James Gunn, who does everything right with guardians of the galaxy that had low expectations, but made everybody happy, or you're the person who, who makes what is a, a quality movie but then everybody pisses on it because, well, Avengers 2 wasn't as good as Avengers 1. Uh, <laughs> it's, and I, I'm going on a limb by saying that Avengers 2 was, was a quality movie. But whatever. Um, it's tough. It, it's, it's hard to, to even think about wanting to be in that position. That's why I think so many people come in, sign up, and then walk away. No, Yeah, definitely. I think these are great. Like, this is, I think this is honestly a great discussion. And I think the fact that no see this is what confuses me a little bit is because shazam is going to be at new line so is it still is it in the dc film universe or is this like essentially an elseworld story to it could just be a production it? thing it, it might be as similar as hulk being uh, at universal although that's that's a little bit bigger of a deal at least new line is still under warner brothers and they they have the the map for this, but it, it could just be like we want to put something on New Line's map that we can both lose money on if it's not a huge success, or it can it can make their year by being there into the DC film universe. I don't know the ins and outs of that, of course, but that that's the way that I would see it being. And it may also be just like we did this because this is where this director was, and we wanted him to work on it, and he's under contract uh, for that production house instead of the other ones. Uh, Patrick, do you have a favorite superhero comic book property that you haven't seen yet? And if you you were able to cast it, what would you do? That I haven't seen yet. The first one that comes to mind is Ms. Marvel. The new one. Yes. The Kamala Khan. Yeah. Yes. I, how is that comic not going... How is that not more active? It's so good. And I would love to see that, even if it's just a TV show, I, I want to see more with that, and I want to see that in the MCU, especially I, after uh, uh, Captain Marvel comes out. In and that may be years. the thing is Captain Marvel's secondary characters, like the the things that you would add on to her with Iron Man. Obviously, you get Rhodey with with Captain America, you get Falcon and Winter Soldier, but 
Captain Marvel uh, doesn't have a huge group of characters that would be. They've been using Alpha Flight characters with her, which has me kind of excited. And in, in depending on how they go with the movie is like if we get Sasquatch and Puck from Alpha Flight. That would be really cool, even if they're just secondary, and then maybe something with Alpha Flight happens one day. But you're right; I love Kamala Khan. I think she's yeah. she's terrific. No, yeah, I was I was actually really excited that you said that. Do you have any any casting choices that you would see with it? I hadn't really thought about it. And, <laughs> uh, I, I'd love to see him. It's obviously a young character, so pick yeah somebody relatively unknown, and you know it's their big break. So now, yeah. did you? Are are you familiar with? Because uh, I think she's in the Avengers Disney XD show. I uh, haven't watched see... that. No. Yeah, she's in. I, they, I, they I re- need to watch that though. <laughs> yeah, she because they bring her in there, and actually, that's the one thing that I've been applauding for. You know, with with them doing this is because they've been able to do, and this is someone coming from someone who hasn't really been following it like he used to, but they've been doing these stories a lot more like the uh from the comics but you know just animating them i think they had her at one point as a central character in in the avengers tv show uh which is really great yeah cool there's a uh, stephanie beatriz who is from brooklyn 99 has been posting pictures of her in cosplay as america chavez uh, she loves the character and wants to play her up on screen now the argument is that america chavez is usually portrayed as a teenage character but it's just kind of incredible to see someone in hollywood picking up on what is this mostly only known to baseline comic book fans and jumping all over it and saying i really want to play this part which is yeah we're in a point where hollywood has made comic book heroes more financially exciting than ever but it's still really cool because America is a still relatively new character. And this is an actress that I really like in her Brooklyn Nine-Nine role. And when I've seen her in parts on like uh, Modern Family and stuff, it just seems really cool that this is a time that we live in now. I look at it and, and then obviously I'm going to do the obvious one here because there is still the tie here. Miles Morales Spider-Man. This is one that I have said, you know, numerous times on here and Corey's always gone, well, you're going to have the backstory and, you know, all sort of like, no, you don't, no. We didn't have to have the backstory. With, no, with I, have, I have a problem with the backstory in, in the comics. Yeah, yeah, you have that problem. And I'm like, <laughs> but no, it's they've simplified it in by confusing it a little bit, but basically just like, don't worry about it. Don't, you know, don't. Here's him. Follow him now, not where he was. Because we're sort of getting that. I, I feel like we might get that going on with the the, at least the TV, like the animated TV side of things you know s- sort of similar to how we got the birth of miles morales where you know we had donald glover going i want to play spider-man he had the 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 film the facebook campaign and the twitter campaign going for it and then you know we've we got you know brian michael bendis took took note and created miles morales spider-man i think we could see something like that happening with uh stephanie beatrice doing this so and, and sony is supposed to be doing a miles morales animated movie they they've been announced it a couple years yeah. ago, so I don't know what the status of that is, but yeah, I'm I'm perfectly accepting that they can do that in in the films or TV shows. My problem is just trying to explain to a, a new comic book reader where the hell Miles Morales came from and why his history is so convoluted when I'm trying to sell them comic books, which is fortunately not my job anymore, so I don't have to deal with that headache. But as as a once, twice, three times a retailer, it still kind of sticks in my craw a little bit. Here's how I always counter that when I because I say, "Hey, you like how in Spider-Man, the cartoon shows, he's always a kid in high school? That's this, you know, because you look at that at the Peter Parker Spider-Man comic books, it's he's older, he's you know got Parker Industries or you know it blew up, so he's going back to the Daily, uh, the the Daily Bugle, and all that stuff. But now we got you know counter over into here, and you know this is him as a kid. You can relate to him. You're a kid, kid. There we go. Ha ha." Well, now that we've had Spider-Man Homecoming, it would almost be cool to see the reverse and have Miles Morales be the adult <laughs> Spider-Man. And... Yeah, yeah that, that would be pretty cool. Um, but I want to move on, because, and I think I have a loose connection here, because aren't Phil Lord and Chris Miller rumored to direct the Miles Morales animated movie? Well, it depends on if they've been fired yet or not. <laughs> it's only a matter of time. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and I mentioned that because uh, Lord and Miller, 
are set to direct Andy Weir, the author of The Martian's new novel, Artemis, for when it comes out. And out of the three of us here, I think only one of us can say that they've seen the cover and will be reading the book really soon. And it ain't me or Corey. Um, <laughs> Not soon enough, really. <laughs> so, yeah. So, um, Patrick, I'm going to throw to you um, because I'm assuming you're a big Andy Weir fan since you're, you know, you're, you're dying to read the book. Well, a big um, Andy Weir fan. I, I've seen The Martian and I own a copy of it. And so that's all of his work that I know of yeah. besides uh, Artemis. But yeah, I'm really looking forward to uh, uh, The Martian's great. And so I'm expecting that from Artemis and yeah. hopefully it won't let me down, but I've been hearing great things. So, And that's the thing too, is Andy Weir is still pretty young in his career of yeah. being a writer. The Martian was his first book, wasn't it? it essentially, he wrote it online and then got the book deal and, and, and got it published and stuff. But he's not had a lot of experience, but it was just such a... a blast off of quality and and it hit the audience right that now you get miller and lord wanting to direct your movie for your new book that isn't even out yet and so you have no idea how successful it is i don't know if i'd want them to direct my movie if i was anywhere <laughs> um it, you know they did a great job on the lego movie i love that movie it's one of my favorite yeah. movies of all time but <laughs> I don't think lightning can strike twice. Uh, I've seen what they've done on uh, Last Man on Earth. I really, I watched that show. I've seen every episode, and I'm continuing to watch it, but I'm kind of hate watching it now. I really can't stand most of the characters in that show. Mm -hmm. It's trying to be funny, and it's it falls flat. It's tiresome, and I'm glad they were taken off of the Han Solo movie and. I, I think I, I can't see a Hans Ola movie with Lego movie style jokes or last man on earth style jokes. It, and so thinking of them and I've seen some other stuff they've done. I um, can't remember well, the 21 what. and 22 jump. Street oh yeah. Movies. Yeah. And see, I can't see how see I met your mother. Working. Yeah. I can't see that stuff working for Han Solo. And I don't know if, I mean, I haven't read Artemis, but if it's anything, a serious sort of story, like, the Martian I can't see that working. It sounds like a murder mystery on the moon from what I got from the description of it. And, and it, or it kind of like a Blade Runner, -y, noir ish novella, but that's, that's just a guess again, without reading it, I don't know, but it does follow up with the, the hard science stuff in the way the, that the he article, with the Martian. Yeah. The article quotes it as this, they describe uh, Artemis as an adrenaline charged crime caper that features smart, detailed world building based on real science. It centers on Jasmine Bashara, a.k.a. Jazz, just another too smart, directionless, 20-something uh, chafing in the constraints of her small town and dreaming of a better life, except the small town happens to be named Artemis, and it's the first and only city on the moon. She goes into debt to pay for a job, and you know, blah, 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 hilarity ensues from there. Which is a problem, because it doesn't sound like a story where hilarity should ensue. Is, is there yeah. a wacky sidekick character that comes in? <laughs> there uh, will be now. Yeah. Uh, it, or they go against type. They go against what we know them for. And I'm with you. I I dropped out of Last Man on Earth pretty early on. I find that Will Forte, who I like a lot, his his comedy is really hit or miss for me. Uh, Fred Armisen, same thing. It's like my wife kept watching all the episodes of Portlandia and she's like, I keep thinking it's going to be funny, but it's never been funny, and I don't know why I haven't learned my lesson yet. I'm like, yeah, I, I know that completely because, again, I can enjoy either of those people in small doses, but a full thing with them in the leads, it's like their style of humor is not for me. And the style of humor in a lot of the, the current comedy stuff, like the 21 Jump Street movies, is not for me. It's just, it seems like modern humor is not where... I'm not clicking with it, which does not mean that there's anything wrong with it. It just means that I'm not the right audience. But I could see Lord and Miller doing something different uh, because they're capable. They're incredibly capable. And the Lego movie is a stellar example of a movie where it's just like, wow, this lands on pretty much every level. It's just a matter of what does it take? And 
for Andy Weir, it was probably just, well, someone's cut me a huge check. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> but and it, I get to <laughs> spend forever. Yeah, I, I look at this honestly as like looking at their Wikipedia, you know, the Wikipedia page where it has their film history and their television history. This is a, it is a lot of comedies that they are yeah. in here doing, you know, and stuff like that. So I I agree with you, Corey. Honestly, one hundred percent. I think it is them trying to break out of the uh, you know break out of doing the comedies. I mean, they it, did my favorite movie of all time, which is Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs. I cannot tell you how much that movie just grabbed my attention. Book I never read uh, as a kid, so I had no connection to it at all up until seeing that. And I'm like, holy crap, this is everything to me. But yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know. I guess one thing you could say is, well, we saw that the audience didn't show up for the new Blade Runner, so a super serious sci-fi movie maybe something that <laughs> Hollywood wants to avoid right now. Maybe we're just too much of a, a group of nerds and give too much importance to Artemis. Cause we're like, Oh, Artemis it's Andy Weir. This has to be, maybe Hollywood's looking at it. It's like, yeah, this is book by the sci-fi. Yeah. He had that one thing, but yeah, yeah. Let's see if these guys can give it a shot. Maybe they don't, they don't care about it enough to give it to somebody with, the background that you might expect for this sort of film. Maybe there's like, oh yeah, we'll give them a shot. Maybe they can do this sort of thing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> if you look at the career of, of uh, Stephen King and you see that his, his biggest hits were things that were more controlled by other people like The Shining for, for decades. And now with it, we finally see something that both looks and feels like what Stephen King has written and earned successes at the same time. Maybe it takes a long time as a writer to get your due for, for that to happen. When The amount of time that Neil Gaiman has had stuff in development and we finally got American Gods and it seems respectful to the source and to him as the creator of it and on top of that turned into a really great property in, in a cinematic sense. Maybe that's just the expectation is, okay, yeah, you, you got lucky once. Let's see if you can get lucky again. We're not ignoring the fact that you you had a huge success in both your book and the film uh, that came out, but this is only number two and these guys are interested in it and we're interested in them more than we're interested in you and your story. So yeah, I, I honestly, I think Beatmaster has it pretty, pretty spot on. This could be the, the I think was it Fox is doing this, the production of this, that this could be them banking on uh, Lord and Miller doing a Russo brothers twist. You know, where because before you look at before Captain America Civil War, they were mainly doing, you know, they were mainly known for directing episodes of community and, you know, executive producing, uh, you know, seasons one through three and then season five or, you know, arrested development or, you know, all like more comedies than, you know, the dramas. So this could be them trying to do, say, like, hey, can you guys do this too? Because you know, look at look at the Russos. They're now directing you know one of the biggest movie franchises in the world, and we want to try to do that with you. This could be them, you know, more of a to put it in television terms, them doing a pilot to then see if it gets picked up for series. That picking up for series would be them doing more dramatic, Oscar worthy directorial stuff that, as opposed to the comedies that might get nominated but don't stand a chance. The only thing I'd say to that is that the Russos were coming from the TV stuff directly into the film stuff, whereas Lord and Miller are already Lord and Miller. Yeah. They, they don't... You don't hire them on because you don't like what they do or because you want them to do things a different way. You hire them on because of their successes that they've already had, and it's up to them. I think they're picking their projects now Whereas the Russos came in and they were picked for something uh, because they showed something that was appealing to the people who were in charge, Kevin Fay or whatever. So I, I think it's a different level of control at that point. But again, they absolutely, I think, are capable enough that they could surprise us or they could do it the way that their vision is. And since we don't know the book, it maybe their vision is exactly right for what Andy is wanting to do. Yeah. 
No, well, if, if Andy Weir has a time traveling duffel bag, then these are the guys to handle. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah. Speaking of the uh, not the Russos, uh, Lord Miller, we got another story about them. Lego, the Lego Movie Two is happening, and they are actually rewriting the script, and they will be tackling gender differences. The main issue I want them to tackle, and this is an important one is that why and actually it's totally a joke but why the female characters they still have the the shape of the lego brick but yet you see the lines drawn in for their hips <laughs> why not just shave that out yeah I, i've been trying to figure that out i look at the character and like, like, like you, you look at wild style yeah, yeah and the, the, i don't know if maybe <laughs> where the leg things are maybe there's not enough uh internal space but uh uh, then they've got the Lego Friends figures. And maybe that's going to play into this because they want to do s more with gender differences. And maybe that'll be, oh, well, Lego Friends, they're the skinny ones. And then you've got the normal Lego figures that are just, you know, these guys yeah. that everybody loves. <laughs> there are some Geek Squad Lego figures that were sent out by, I think, Webroot or something to the Best Buy stores. And one of them is a female agent, which is... I was really excited that they did that, that they thought about having multiple genders represented. One of the things that I liked about the first Lego movie, though, is that there were female characters involved because when I was a kid, I had my Mega superhero figures. And it never occurred to me that I was only supposed to play with the boy figures uh, or that the female figures are supposed to be secondary or my Star Wars figures. Again, you know, Leo was just as important to the stories that I was playing out with them that as any other character probably more important because i recognized her whereas i didn't recognize a lot of the other characters or they were just slightly known uh and they had a cool name and and backing card for the for the figure from the packaging but what i'm confused about and and not terribly confused is it sounds like part of what they're doing with the gender differences is they're involving the duplo blocks because the the kid in the movie is dealing with his little sister coming in and disrupting his play with her stuff and having her kind of take over, which is not necessarily a gender fight as it is an age fight. And certainly that girls might play differently than boys, but I think, again, you're going to see it more from the perspective because she's a young girl versus an older boy and how they like to interact with their toys and stuff. At least it's not a... The girls are are relegated to the pink aisle of Toys R Us, like a lot of other stuff, like even Toy Story went into is, oh, you've got all your toys, you've got aliens and cowboys and all these other things, and I've got Barbie and Ken. I, yeah. I had a cousin who was my age. We all played with the stuff together, and she definitely had Barbie figures and a Wonder Woman Barbie style doll that I was happy to play with when I was there. But a lot of the stuff had a lot of crossover, and it didn't matter what our gender was. And I, I'm, I'm gonna I want to throw the Patrick on this real quick uh, before, but before I do that, I want to say because me, it's the exact opposite. You know, my I have a sister; she's two years younger than me, and you know, this is our childhood room. I just took it over because she got married and moved out. But you know, we had each our own toys. You know, I was the one the kid sitting there, you know, on my half of the room playing with my Legos and stuff, and she's over there playing with her Barbies. And, you know, very stereotypical, you know, with me, it was Legos and Transformers. With her, it was Barbie and whatever else she played with. You know, this is, this is like 15 years ago, so I don't know. I don't remember. Um, and you like, and then you, like, so I could, I definitely relate to this because, you know, older brother, little sister, you know, the voice upstairs is saying, hey, you got to play with, you got to let your sister play too. And it's like, oh, she's just going to bring her Barbies in here and I'm playing Lego, not Barbie. And all that stuff, but uh, Patrick, what, what about you? I mean, like, how? What, what are your thoughts on that part? Like the whole, you know, sibling dynamic. Well, I didn't have a sister. I, I have a younger brother, and so uh, we had in our basement a ping pong table that was covered in Lego. We built our own city, but we had the female characters back in the '80s. They all had the hair that came out to the side, and so yeah. they were an active part of our city. Whether they're working in the uh, the medical center, or they're at the house. Uh, some of them were at the spaceport, or in the castle. We, had, yeah, the the leader of the castle was a queen, I think. Yeah. And 
uh, or princess. I don't know. That's my brother's stuff. But uh, yeah, I know I'm gonna, my son's going to have uh, Lego in, with female characters, and that's they'll just be part of that. So yeah, when I grew up in the '70s, the the gender cutoff was more because of how the toys were were sold to us than mm -hmm. it was that we made those choices. And I, I think that we've we've grown and somewhat. I mean, look how hard it is still to to get Marvel superhero figures with with female characters in them for, for a long time. It was like, oh yeah, we don't want to sell these characters. We're selling them to boys. And it's like, well, what if the girls enjoy them? And so they were canceling cartoons because girls were watching instead of boys watching that, that they thought they couldn't sell them the toys. Uh, that's one of the reasons why I guess they said that they canceled Young Justice and some other stuff. Or Black Widow is the one who's riding on the motorcycle in Age of Ultron, but in the action figures, you see Captain America riding the motorcycle because Cap's got a bike and Black Widow doesn't. It's like, well, they both do to a degree, and and they both should and can. But I well, I, I agree. I, I think it's it's nice to see that your kids aren't going to have that same level of girls play with with this and boys play with this and girls cut hair and and become hairdressers and and stuff and boys have have war figures and stuff and when i was growing up i liked lego on its own i there were no ads on tv getting me to buy the latest sets there was no cartoon series it was just you get the box all you can see is what's on the front and what's on the back. And then there'd be a catalog in the middle, but you'd have to make up your own stories. And so built the world, however I wanted to build it. And there was no marketing telling me, telling me, well, this is this, these sets are for boys. These sets are for girls. Now, granted there were the Paradisa sets, which were pink. And so it didn't really interest me when there's spaceships on the other page, right. but there was one set that had a pool and it was Paradis and it was pink. I always thought, oh, it'd be cool to have that set because there's a pool and I could have the the, the characters in the pool. It was different than any other piece I had. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I wanted to have my guys have a pool party in there. <laughs> oh, yeah. See, no, this is where, I mean, you're honestly, you're putting me to shame because I came into it. Um, I think I had like two sets that weren't Star Wars and like, but one was a space shuttle set. And then it was all like Star Wars sets. It was like, because yeah. you know, growing up, I was big into Star Wars. I still am, but I mean, it was like, you know, everything was Star Wars. And so, and so it was like, uh, I, I even still have up on my dresser over here on top, I still have Lego, uh, Star Wars Legos up there. And so it was always, you know, I would, but it would be, I would build the ship. And then after a while, I'd be like, well, let's modify. And then it was, let's take it apart and then build, build my own ship. And so that's what that's basically what I did now, and I, sh I think I have three up there that I built that are custom. In, and in my mind, the physics work, but probably not really. <laughs> so the other the other part I want to get I want to get your guys' opinion on is the fact that this is actually going to do for a Lego movie. This is going to do something really interesting. This is going to tell the story from two perspectives as opposed to just one. So you're getting it both from. Uh, Finn, the boy, and the first, you know, the live action bits from his, where Emmett is the hero. But how is this going to look like for Finn's sister? Is Emmett going to be the hero, or is he just going to be a bumbling buffoon? When I read that, the first thing that came to mind was I think the book was The Pig Man, where okay. it, each chapter was written by alternating characters. So there's a boy and a girl. And they'd take turns writing chapters. And so you'd see each perspective. And they'd kind of uh, comment on the previous one as if they're like, no, that's not how it happened. And, and so I, I think it would be interesting to see the movie in that sort of way. Like, okay, here's Finn. He's down there playing with his Lego. And this stuff happens. And then, oh, he's going to go wash up. Oh, now it's his sister playing. And oh, now this, <laughs> that, could, that could be fun. But that, but with that though, that almost seems more like a TV show than a movie. Well, you know, a few minutes of this, a few minutes of that, and then yeah. ultimately it comes together, and they they have this big battle. But then they'll come together in the end, and everything works out, and we can cooperate and uh, it, fight 
Lord Business or whoever the bad bad guy is. <laughs> Just real fast, have you guys ever read that Exquisite Corpse? Uh, it's a meme that was passed around for a while. Uh, it's um, an Exquisite Corpse is a story where where one person takes the first line of the story and the next person writes the next line and so on and so forth. And there was one going around that two students were given an assignment that they had to write together and the girl started writing her story and it was going to be a teenage girl typical love story. And then the guy starts writing his part of it and it becomes instantly about her character is killed off and and like <laughs> space marines yes. show up and start yeah. doing it and, and she keeps going back and forth but the space marines decide that what they really are looking for is love and it's just like the whole back and forth that was so perfectly stereotypical gender biased but it was still incredibly funny and, and you just made me think about that with that the pigman thing which now i want to read there was also a superhero book called soon i shall be invincible that was written with two perspectives it was the villain of the book who had killed i guess the main superhero was trying to reestablish himself and then the new heroine uh joining the justice league style team and everything it would go back and forth between the two it was almost written like a blog but from two different characters perspectives i don't know well, where i was going with any of this it just reminded me about the things one trap <laughs> i hope they don't fall into with this though is because it mentioned duplo and so i hope they don't say oh well uh, girls, are, they have these Duplo blocks. They're inferior, and you know they're girly. And here's Emmett; with, he's the hero that we know from the last movie. I hope it's not Duplo versus Lego because no, yeah. Duplo has its time and a place, and it's for babies. And hopefully, this girl has grown up and moved past the Duplo. We can get into the actual, real gender dynamics, and not so much age dynamics. Yeah. Oh, definitely. I I agree with that one hundred percent, because I like to emphasize that because like you were talking about with the the Lego Friends uh, line and stuff like that. I would rather see that. So I would hope that they would age the characters, you know, two or three years to where mm -hmm. you know she's not playing with Duplo anymore. She's playing, you know, with his Legos, but then with the Lego Friends line and stuff like that. Yeah. And they probably um, want to market that because yeah, <laughs> they need to. <laughs> honestly, I, I I could honestly look at that like yeah, if there's a way to market like a combining of the two, like to where <laughs> there's a little bit more, which Lego Movie would do that to to where you know we get because it's all even now it's we get the the girl characters you know the Lego friends they're you know more built like actual people. Mm -hmm. As opposed to like bricks and basic shapes of people, then maybe that would lead to you know better Lego designs overall. When when it, you know with the merchandising and stuff like that. Well, my, my niece is she's uh fourteen now, but she's never had any interest in Lego Friends, uh, even yeah. though they've got equestrian sets and she's big into horses. She really doesn't want friends because she thinks the people look weird. And she's so used to the classic characters. Yeah. Right. She's had handed down to her and uh, gotten her on her own. That, that's the, the, the stereotypical thing of female fantasy armor uh, with the, <laughs> the, the breast cutouts and everything or whatever it is. It's just you don't need to change something to make it appeal to girls or women if they're into what it is you're doing then they're into it for what it is not because you had to sexualize it or genderfy it for their purposes it's like no there's there's certainly something to be said for maybe some young women want to see their armor look more attractive and that's fine but that's not what it should all be about and if you have a character that's interested in that then that could be the story that you tell but yeah, I, I, I completely get it. It's like, oh, I like Legos. Oh, great. Well, here's Legos for girls. I don't like Legos for girls. I like Legos. Exactly. Yeah. And then back in the day, they used to advertise girls and boys playing it, with magazine ads. They didn't have TV ads, but they'd yeah. both be playing with the same sets. But yeah. I guess they, they think they need to do it separate. So. I, don't know. I, I look at this, you know, since I work at Target and I'm, you know, I, I walk down the aisles all the time and I see how they have the aisle set up right now for for Lego. They have the the Lego friends and the the Disney uh, Legos on one on one side of the aisle, and then the other is the 
not necessarily licensed because the licensed stuff like Star Wars, Minecraft, go on the other side, but the superheroes, the Marvel ones are on this uh, the side over the opposite of it. To where, and then it's like the more generic, you know, like architecture and then you know, regular buildings and stuff like that. Opposite, I could see them, you know, sort of then blending those two aisles together. That's my hope. My other fear that I have, and I don't know if you guys share this, is I'm hoping we don't get outcry of people going, well, why isn't there a female writer? Just because, like, I, f- I feel like we could fall into this trap here of it's being written by guys. How are they going to tell the girls' point of view when they're not girls? and stuff like that like that's one thing that just sort of popped in my head as i'm looking at this, like the whole well boys versus girls thing well how they know they're not girls and stuff like that you know as someone who sometimes tells stories it would be really horrible for me if i was only able to ever tell stories from a white 40 something year old male's perspective so i i i get why there needs to be more representation from writers uh, of of different genders, identities, races, everything else, I completely agree with that uh, because it brings in new stories that yeah. maybe us crazy old white guys can't come up with on our own, or maybe we can, but we just don't because it's not what we're used to doing. I absolutely am in love with having a a more inclusive Hollywood and more inclusive creativity across the board in books, in comics, and everything, but. Yeah, didn't, the idea of pushing it so far as that only women can tell stories about women and only African Americans can tell stories about African Americans. It's just something that if you are a person who is a male that is telling those stories, you need to be really conscious of what you're telling um, and making sure that you don't just follow stereotypes because that's all you've known. I only bring that up just because, you know, I could see people doing that. When it, when it, they're watching a movie, like, oh, that was a good movie, but wait, there was no female writers. Her, I'm mad now. When I mean, really, you know, the, like they're probably looking at it's more of from the kid perspective that I think they, you know, Lord Miller or the other, you know, the other writers involved might have daughters, and they might see how they play with their toys and stuff like that, and the stories that they tell. Um, you know, like uh, it reminds me. I don't know if you guys ever saw the uh, the YouTube series on Geek and Sundry, uh, written by a kid. Where they had yes. oh, right. <laughs> kids in general telling these stories, and, and then they had was it, it was either animated or they had actors acting out what the kids were talking about. And you know, that's a great example because here you had boys and you had girls, and they were telling completely different stories. And then sometimes they were telling very similar stories. And it was just, you know, it was what it was. And, you know, it, it's just, I don't really have a point with this. Rob, no, uh, X Cop is a very good example of that. X Cop was the the guy who was drawing out the stories that his little brother was telling him, making up. Uh, yeah. I also love seeing the artwork of of uh, girls who've drawn creatures or superheroes that they've designed and stuff like that, and then a more established comic book style artist or fantasy artist has taken that and drawn it to look more in lines with popular art and everything. And you see it kind of taking that next level. I love that kind of thing because, again, the imagination of kids is something that is so valuable because they are fearless. And when yeah. we get older, I think we we allow ourselves to feel like, oh, well, that's too far out there for me to reach for. And I'm just going to play it safer in this little book house over here. Oh, yeah, definitely. Any last thoughts on this before we move on? Uh, Lord Miller should stick to Lego related movies. And that's <laughs> What about Clone High? Well, I don't know anything about that, but maybe. <laughs> oh, that was their was really that was their that was their first thing that they really that they got success from. It was an MTV series that uh, lasted for one season. Basically, it was the premise was these clones of famous people are in this high oh, school. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. Okay. it was um, a really good cartoon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, on MTV. Well, they also had Daria and Beavis in my head, but. After it was after that when they were you know after Beavis and Butthead and Daria when this came out it was in the two thousands when it was all about the real world. Uh, but yeah, so that's gonna do it for the news, and we will be right back real quick before we jump into the else words. We are curious. We want to hear from you. How can we improve the show? You can you can tell us by going to bit.ly slash en survey twenty seventeen. That is capital E capital N capital S then Irve twenty seventeen. 
and you will and on there you'll answer five questions i think about you know how how we can we improve the show you know like bringing on do we need to bring on more guests like patrick delahanty yes um do we need to talk less about things probably you know how whatever it is you, you let us know we will do our best to accommodate and we will we thank the people who have already done that patrick uh tell us about the stuff that you're doing you know because you are a busy man yeah <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. I, I do a website, fancons.com, which spun off of a site, animecons.com. And so comic conventions, anime conventions, sci-fi cons, fantasy cons, furry cons, steampunk cons, video game cons, they're all covered there and uh, listed worldwide. And so that takes up a lot of my free time. We also do a podcast, Anime Cons TV. And uh, every Monday we have a new episode, and we're um, we're finishing up our ninth year of that. Nice. And did you see anything about that story about the comic convention that was sued for saying it was a comic con, and how the I guess it was just established that the cease and desist and or the the gag order that they had on them was considered illegal. And so there, it's up in the air now of whether they get to call themselves a Comic Con after San Diego wanted to sue them out of existence. Yeah, San Diego Comic Con was suing uh, Salt Lake Comic Salt Lake Con, City, Salt yeah. Lake City Comic Con, and uh, it's they don't really have a case. It's a, become a generic term, uh, but also they had tried to trademark it a while back, but now that was found to be generic but there's still i don't know it, i've lost track of where that case has gone and i'm just waiting for it to be over to see okay what's what's the final thing i don't think it sh- they've got anything to stand on that shouldn't hold up uh because there's so many people using the term comic con now whether yeah. it's spelled with two c's or th- three c's by two separate words or hyphenated or not it's all generic as far as i'm concerned it's everybody can yeah. call it comic con if you wanted to trademark it it's too late um, yeah that, that ship has sailed yeah although it's no, yeah, it's yeah. always odd to see the things that can be trademarked because the fact that dc and marvel hold a trademark on the term superhero uh always <laughs> sat wrong with me hasbro is desperately trying to trademark transformers names and it oh. can't do some of them like i think it, it was trying to get bumblebee yeah, it was trying to sue. It was trying to sue DC Comics because they have the Teen Titan, or the, yeah. well, the Titan Bumblebee. And I'm like, so are they going to go for the Tuna Company next? Yeah, and <laughs> they can't trademark Jazz. So now every time you see a, that Transformer, it's Autobot Jazz on every yeah. toy. <laughs> so silly. Yeah, yeah. So silly. Say, we can't have Hot Rod anymore. It's Hot Rodimus. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so that it it's not anything unless Judd Nelson is doing the voice. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yeah, the best version of the Transformers franchise movies. But yeah, so um, and we'll, we'll let you plug again, you know, at the end of your stuff. But yeah, it's it's cool. I I, I kid you not when I I like people when I say he is a busy man. Patrick, you know, if you're not... t- can correct me if I'm if I'm remembering this wrong. Didn't you make the first dancing Groot? Yes, uh, I made uh, after I saw Guardians of the Galaxy. Within two, I think two weeks, I made a dancing Groot. Other people had made Groot; they made him in, in their gardens or whatever. The little baby Groot. I made one that actually dances by getting a dancing flower and changing right. it. Right, yeah. and I remember people I knew were like, "Oh my God, someone made a dancing Groot! That's so amazing!" I'm like, I. I totally know who that dude is uh, <laughs> i met that yeah. guy that guy is awesome i i brought it to a convention i finished it it's like oh well let's go to this convention and there was a writer from uh one of the guardians of the galaxy comics there and so he got pictures of it and i had posted on vine and i had posted it on tumblr and it really never went anywhere and then uh slowly it started to catch on and then suddenly the floodgates opened and it went viral and got over a million hits. Um, yeah. MTV, CNET, a whole bunch of outlets covered it. And, you know, over a million views on YouTube and I've made it zero. Uh, yeah. 
Zero yeah, money living the big off of life that in video. Hollywood and you know you're <laughs> well, set for life. You've got billions it, of dollars. It annoys me that there's ads on that video and I have not made a single cent from it because oh. the uh, the song that's used the th- not even thirty second clip of that Michael Jackson song oh. it got monetized by MCA or whoever has it and so ugh. Even though it's terrible quality, it's a short clip. It should be fair use, and yeah. I I put that in like no, this should be fair, and they they fight back say nope. So unless I want to risk a strike on my account or you know get lawyers involved, it's like all right. And by now the ship has sailed, so I'm not making. Even though it got ads on that, I wouldn't make any money. So did you did you get uh did you actually get people asking you how you made it? Oh yeah, so many people and. I, I <laughs> since then I have never used the phrase "shut up and take my money" because I heard it so often. Oh yeah, <laughs> everybody was saying that "shut up and take my money." There's so many comments in that video, and every, a lot of people were asking, "How did you make this?" And so I posted pictures of the production process yeah. on my Facebook page, and uh, people were like, "Oh, I can't find one of those uh, dancing flowers." The, the sh- Prices on eBay for those shot up. I got mine for twenty seven dollars. Uh, after that video, they went up to like hundreds. <laughs> I was thinking, so you, damn, I should have bought more. <laughs> you you yeah. made a lot of other people a lot of money and got yeah. nothing. For I got it. nothing. Uh, I did get to meet James Gunn at Dragon Con. Oh, uh, awesome. tons of people were coming up to me and say, "Oh, I need a picture of that." And then I was walking through their. Uh, Hall of Fame, where they have people do autographs. Sean Gunn, it's like, oh my god, Dancing Groot, I need a picture. He calls me over to the, <laughs> the table. The autograph is just about to start, and I'm cutting in front of everybody just so he can get a picture with Dancing Groot. I never got a picture of him. I, I should have asked, like, oh, can we get a picture together? But I didn't want to be that guy because everybody else is waiting <laughs> to pay. Which but- is... <laughs> He got a picture of Dancing Groot, sent it to his brother. And then I see Grant Imahara from Mythbusters. And it's like, oh, Patrick, Dancing Groot, can I get a picture? And he went to the green room and showed it to James Gunn. And so I was at a party for <laughs> Night Attack that night. Uh, Ali Spagnola was playing, and I have Dancing Groot up in the air. And somebody runs in and says, James Gunn outside. James Gunn's outside. Come. And so I go outside. <laughs> James Gunn is standing there. It's like, can we get a picture together? And oh, sure. So we're. Sta- I have a few photos of us standing together with G- with a baby Groot in the middle, and then there's my friend that was taking pictures. Just kept taking pictures, which is great. But you yeah. can see other people start to come in <laughs> to join in the photos, <laughs> yeah, and so I was like, okay. And it's like, okay, it's getting really crowded here. I was like, I'll, I'll let you go. Thank you. I bumped into him later. And it's like, hey, but. Yeah, and so I follow him on Twitter ever since. So that's where I get all my news. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I follow him on Facebook. He he seems like an incredibly terrific guy. And oh yeah, yeah. And certainly, I I don't think that he or or Sean would ever be adverse to you taking a picture with them, but especially knowing what you what you made. But that yeah. that yeah, it was just so funny to see this and everybody talking about, it, including I think James had posted on his Facebook at the time, and going. Oh yeah, Patrick did that. that that's awesome. <laughs> yeah, I I really wish I could have had a uh, gone to the premiere of Volume Two with Baby Groot, but uh, missed that yeah. opportunity. Um, and so, for the last six, well, ever since Volume Two opened, Baby Groot has been on the set of uh, Tech News Today and Tech News Weekly at, here at Twit. Yeah. So you can nice. see him sitting in the corner in the background. <laughs> that's the that, that's the one thing that I would do, and it's it's funny because I bought I got the Funko Pops. Uh, you could see both of them in in the back behind me, um, but I've got the regular sized version of Adult Groot and then the oversized version of Baby Groot. So I, <laughs> I like doing that reverse. It's like, and, and I would do it in the podcast and just be like, all right, and and he comes in frame. Um, just when I was bored and, you know, Corey was ranting about something, I'm like, all right, I need, I need a comedic moment for myself, just for myself. <laughs> Pull it in here. But no, yeah, that's honestly cool. And I, I forgot about that until you mentioned it. I'm like, oh yeah, I remember watching that, you know, in the live feed when they're like, baby, girl. I'm like, oh my gosh. So the, before, so the convention before where it got all big, that was before DragonCon? Yeah. 
That was uh, Stockton Con, which is not a great convention, honestly. Uh, it's very <laughs> small, but it happened to be right after we finished it. And um, uh, my wife, then fiance, and I, she sculpted the head and I did the body and uh, she painted the head and I molded the arms. But uh, yeah, we brought it and everybody needed a picture. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> nice. For more on this Galactic Network podcast, go to GNCast.com. That's G-N-C-A-S-T-S dot com.